thing. In Revelation chapter 7, John spotlight concerning the choosing of the 144,000. Let's read what it says. And after these things, after he had seen these things, and the antecedent to these is the events depicted in chapter 6, which give you the overview of judgments in the last days, under the figures of the white, the black, I mean the white, the red, the black, and the pale horse, and the other openings of the seals. Then he says, Now after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Now that just tells us that the earth is square, whether you believe that or not. <laughs> Got to do something to get life going. <clears throat> you can make an argument for that. Some people have. <clears throat> Holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel. Now they saw, first of all, four angels. And then he says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth. Now these are four destroying angels, or at least their ministry at this time is one of destruction. So he says then, he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now let me turn to the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 321, where he deals with chapter 7 of the uh, book of Revelation and just says briefly this. This is the report. It's a digest of his discourse. Four destroying angels holding power over the four quarters of the earth. That's a better translation. Until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads which signifies sealing the blessings upon their heads, meaning the new and everlasting covenant. And in this he goes on to indicate bringing them into the church of the firstborn. Okay? Now can you see this again, that clarification? You see four angels. They have power to destroy. Then you see a fifth angel. And this fifth angel ascends from the east, and as the four angels are about to do their thing, he says, hey, fellas, now you hang on. Don't get overzealous. We've got a job to do before we reap down the earth, even though it's as corrupt as it is. And the thing we've got to do then is to seal the servants of God in their foreheads, which means sealing the blessings of the gospel and the house of the Lord upon them, see and thereby organizing the Church of the Firstborn. Now, uh, let's go to section 77 again and pick up the picture here as the prophet Joseph Smith uh, gives it to us. He says, for instance, and here's a very important clarification, verse uh, 8. What are we to understand by the four angels spoken of in the seventh chapter and first verse of Revelation? And note his answer. We are to understand that they are four angels sent forth from God, to whom is given power over the four parts of the earth to save life and to destroy. Their powers are to seal to eternal life and to seal to the damnation of hell and to raise to life and to administer judgment unto death. All right, uh, over the four parts of the earth to save life and to destroy. These are they, now note this, these are they who have the everlasting gospel to commit to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people having power to shut up the heavens, to seal up unto life, or to cast down to the regions of darkness. 
Now, who are the four major angels that had and committed the everlasting gospel? Who were they? Keep in mind that John the Baptist, in restoring the preparatory gospel, merely acted under the direction of Peter. Peter restored the uh, everlasting gospel in the sense of its basic powers. Then you go to the Kirtland Temple, and in the Kirtland Temple you had three mighty angels, and they came and committed keys of authority by which the program and plan of the everlasting gospel is established. And those then were, first of all, Moses, gathering of Israel, leading the ten tribes, one of the great gospel angels. There's Elias, or Noah, who committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, reappointed the promises of Abraham, centered in them in Joseph and Oliver, and said, In you and in your posterity now all nations of the earth will be blessed, and we give you these keys and these rights. And then Elijah came, and he restored the fullness of the holy priesthood and the sealing power as it relates to the house of the Lord. Okay? So that you have Peter, Moses, Elias, and Elijah, the four great gospel angels. And what is their power? Their power then is to seal up unto life or to cast down unto death. Now in the beginning of this dispensation, we had the seed time, the planting time, the beginning time. And then the design is that the gospel be taught, and people are brought to the church. And then in the great cleansing of Zion, then you finally get a group of people raised to the level where you've got fullness of priesthood. And the blessings then that pertain to the house of the Lord and the endowment of glory. And the harvest period of the dispensation begins. And that harvest period is carried on essentially by the same angels that established it. They committed the gospel. They committed its power and its revelation and its taught. And then those four angels now holding power not only to seal unto life but to thrust down to hell are committed the responsibility of cleansing the earth. And they're the four great gospel angels. Note what is said now in the next verse. What are we to understand by the angel ascending from the east? Revelation 7th chapter and 2nd verse. We are to understand that the angel ascending from the east is he to whom is given the seal of the living God over the twelve tribes of Israel. Wherefore he crieth unto the four angels, having the everlasting gospel, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in our foreheads. And then the prophet adds, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to come to gather together the tribes of Israel and restore all things. Now this particular Elias is John the Revelator. And his ministry is depicted in the book of Revelation in the tenth chapter with the little book which he is instructed to eat, with the instruction that he would yet prophesy before kings and nations and uh, he then, with the four great gospel angels then, are in charge of this great harvest season. Under their authority, the 144,000 will be called, and they will minister. Now, who are the 144,000? Let me read now further in section 77. When or what time are the things spoken of this chapter to be fulfilled? Now, this sealing of them. Let's get to that first. They are to be accomplished in the 6,000 years or the opening of the sixth seal during that period of time. Sometime between now and the opening of the seventh seal, there's going to be a calling of 144,000. And uh, they will be prepared. They will be great high priests. Note what the Lord says about it. Uh, what are we to understand by sealing the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel? 12,000 out of every tribe. 
we are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the holy order. Now these aren't high priests, say for example, like I'm a high priest. I'm a high priest in the ecclesiastical order, have the temporary job of member of the High Council of the Alpine Stake of Zion. That high priest office then is in the ecclesiastical order. These high priests are the kind of high priests that Abraham wanted to become. Read chapter 1 of Abraham, where he sought for his appointment, and he became a high priest, holding the rights belonging to the Father. And this order of priesthood came down from the beginning. It was conferred upon me by the Father, see. And it came down and it pertains to God's appointment to the fathers concerning their seed, you see. Now, a high priest of the holy order is one, first of all, who has received fullness of priesthood in the house of the Lord, where it's given and where only it is given. And it's given as a joint ordinance. And in that sense, then, the sisters are involved and will be involved in that great ministry. All right, so it's a joint ordinance, and it's conferred in the house of the Lord, and one who is a high priest then is one who has received that fullness of priesthood and then presides in that order. He has the right to do it. He has the right to administer fullness of priesthood, and he has a right to preside in the holy order of God on that plane and level of the Zion society. All right, now with that clarification, what are we to understand by the sealing of the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel? And keep in mind, 12,000 out of every tribe. We are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel, for they are they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom it is given power over the nations, and those angels are the four gospel angels and the apostle John, who ascends from the east and says, hang on, brethren, we've got a work to do first. I've got a special mission which Christ gave me, for which I was a translated being and am a translated being, and this is depicted in the little book. And his ministry now is to bring Israel to God. Okay? And so he says, then, these high priests then are ordained and uh, by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. Now, this is not a missionary crew. They will preach the gospel. They will do that, yes. But their primary objective, then, is to take those who have received the gospel and been sanctified and bring them into the church of the firstborn by and through the the sealing powers of the holy priesthood and the fullness of the priesthood given in the house of the Lord. And that's the way you build the church of the firstborn. And it's that church that's going to be caught up to meet Christ in his coming in glory. And so, as a part of this great harvest season, the book of Revelation now deals with the harvest. The restoration of the gospel, that's history. The coming of Peter, James, and John, that's history. The coming of Moses, Elias, and Elijah, that's history. And we have administered and taught the gospel, and we go on through, and then the time comes when John sees these major events. And so with that, let's go back now to Revelation chapter 7. And in this particular revelation, then, let's read what he says. He saw four angels standing on the four corners, or parts, or quarters, rather, of the earth, holding the four winds, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel, and that other angel now is John, the fifth angel, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was, was given to hurt the earth, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And this is the sealing powers of the priesthood. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now, a clarification or two. You've got to gather enough of the tribes to have a basis to do that. The return of the ten tribes will come before the selection of the hundred and forty-four thousand. That's simple. 
the return of the ten tribes will come before the opening of the seventh seal. That's simple. Now there will also be those from Judah who will be thus sealed. There wasn't everyone in Judah wasn't participating in the crucifixion of Christ. For example, on the day of Pentecost, uh, which was a holiday, a celebration, glorious day, there were people gathered to Jerusalem, Jewish people from all nations. And uh, on that sacred day, the power and gifts of the gospel were poured out, cloven tongues of fire rested upon the elders in a sacred endowment. And those who heard it then says, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter gave them the standard program of the gospel. He says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this promise is unto you and to your children, to those who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. All right, so they gave them that program. They weren't under condemnation. But if you read the third chapter, of the book of Acts, where he's talking about the people who were responsible. He says, I would that you hadn't done this. And then he administers a different program of redemption for them. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. He didn't say anything about baptism. They weren't worthy of it. They were in a situation where they had sinned grievously against great light and truth, crucifying the Messiah himself. And so he gave them the only formula of redemption he could give them, that was to go to hell and pay the debt in a repentant state, and then come forth and receive some kind of a, of a redemption. So he says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. The times of refreshing are when the earth is renewed to its paradisical state. If they would repent and be converted, their sins would be blotted out, not in baptism, but when the times of refreshing shall come, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things. See? Now, there were Jews then who were responsible for the crucifixion of Christ and who were under condemnation. There were others who were not. And I suspect uh, in these mighty events, while the Jewish nation as a nation is not redeemed until the final end of things, that there will be those of the sons of Judah who will participate in many of these things. See, There will be those of the sons of Judah who do. But you will have then, before the opening of the seventh seal, the calling out and giving the sacred rites and appointments of high priest within the holy order and over the holy order to a body of men of 144,000 from every tribe of Israel. Now, we are from Ephraim, and Ephraim will be called out and elected first, I presume, because he's the birthright tribe. And uh, you'll get some then from Joseph and from the Indian people. And when the ten tribes come and they will return in a body, the prophet Joseph said that so clear there should be no issue on the matter. He gave us that knowledge with such certainty that there should be absolutely no issue on that matter. And they will return as a body and they'll have prophets in their midst. And like we said this afternoon, they will come to Zion and be crowned with glory. And from among that body, that body of Israel, then many of the 144,000 will be called because they will be on that plane and that level of things, see. Now let me just make this clarification. The prophet Joseph Smith makes it clear that the 144,000 began to be called out as early as Kirtland. And there were some of the faithful brethren in Kirtland who were given that promise that they would be part of that number. The 144,000 will include not just mortal people, but translated people and even some resurrected people. And John the Revelator, who is... Uh, who is a translated being with Peter and with Moses and with Elias and with Moses, I mean with Elijah, will preside over that great work. And this is the harvest. This is the gathering of the wheat. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares. And you gather the wheat into the church of the firstborn. And when that's done, and it's done then through this sacred ministry, then, then you have the time then for the cleansing of the earth, see. Then these four angels who restored the gospel and who have power to seal to life and to exaltation and also power to seal to damnation and to hell, then they will preside over this great cleansing period of time in the earth, see. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. It's about the great harvest season of this earth and about the ushering into the millennial period and the cleansing of Zion and the cleansing of the earth. 
and eventually then the celestialization of the earth as an abode for the righteous. And it's, it's that simple. It's just that simple, see. Now he talks then about the 144,000, and then he goes on and says, and beheld great multitudes which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples. It's one thing to be the work crew, the 144,000 who do this. And these are high priests, and there'll be others, another thing then to receive the benefits and blessings and receive fullness of priesthood and prepared and made members of the church of the firstborn. And this will be a great multitude, uh, he says uh, uh, here indicated, having clothes, uh, clothed with robes of righteousness and palms in their hands and so forth, see. All right, so much for chapter 7. It's this, it's this spotlight then on this great and important function of preparing a people for the second coming of the Lord, this great harvest season presided over then by the great angels of the gospel with the apostle Paul, with the apostle John, who came up to that sacred uh, level then of authority within the holy priesthood of this earth because of his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's John the Beloved, and by his love then he received that appointment, and by his choice then to remain and be a translated being, he's given the promise that he will prophesy before nations and before kingdoms. And in that sense then that will be fulfilled, that promise, in this period of time when he goes forth with the 144,000 performing this sacred sealing work. All right then, in chapter 8, it begins by saying, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for the space of about half an hour. Now that's the Lord's time. One day of the Lord is a thousand years for us. You compute that out. And a half hour is about 21 years of time. And when he says about half an hour, and he's not talking exactly half an hour, but about. And I suspect then it may be a few months over that, say 21 years, 10 months, or something like that, see? And in that sense then, there's silence there. And it's during that period of silence in heaven that this great task force goes forth. These are those who fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 16. I will send for fishers, and then I'll send for hunters and they'll hunt them out of every hole and every crevice in the rock, see? The great 144,000. They're really the ones who teach the gospel and administer its power and who seal up those who reject it to the damnation of hell. Read section 1 of the Doctrine and Counts, where power is given to those then who bear the message of the gospel to seal up to the damnation of hell those who reject this message. Now, the missionaries may go forth with some measure of that power, but its fullness is exercised by the 144,000. And when they get through, when they get through, note then what John says, And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and, and to them were given seven trumpets. And now here you're preparing now for the, for the great cleansing of the earth. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar uh, which were before the throne. And the smoke of the incense and so forth came up. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes, and the seven angels which had the seven trumps prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned, and so forth. And so you go through those great plagues of the last time. Now let me just clarify. Those plagues are spoken of in two places in the book of Revelation, chapters 8 and 9. And then John comes around and gives a different slant to them in chapters 15 and 16, okay? Now, for the sake of time, let me rush on. Now, chapter 10, then, is a special spotlight on John the Revelator. And uh, it speaks of him then. He says, I saw a mighty angel stand upon the earth and to lift up his hand to the heaven. This mighty angel is Michael the archangel. And he swear by him that lived forever and ever, who created heaven and things thereon and the earth, the things therein and so forth, that there should be time no more. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, and this is a period of time that we're dealing with, he says, when 
he shall begin to sound his, his, the mystery. And there's an extended period. That horn rather continues on when he shall begin to sound. The mystery of God should be finished and he, as he hath declared it to his servants the prophets. And then he uh, says this, And I went unto the angel, and, and he said, uh, And he said unto me, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but as it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Now let me turn again to section 77 of the Doctrine and Covenants. For the prophet now is dealing with this, the question is asked, for example, uh, what are we to understand by the sounding of the trumpets mentioned in the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation? Well, hey, I need to get that. I'm, I'm a little out of kilter here. Let me let me just mention that. We'll come back to that. Let's go to. Uh, uh, Verse 14, what do we understand by the little book which was eaten by John, as mentioned in the 10th chapter of Revelation? We are to understand that it was a mission and an ordinance for him to gather the tribes of Israel before, behold, this is Elias, who, as it is written, must come to restore all things. Now, Elias is one who presides over the holy order, see? And he has the mission, then, of restoring uh, all Israel. But we've left out a point here that's vital and important. We need to come back, and so let me do that at this time. Now, in verse 12, let's get another clarification. What are we to understand by the sounding of the trumpets mentioned in the eighth chapter of Revelation? These seven trumpets of cleansing and so forth, see. He says, we are to understand, and note how he puts this, that as God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he finished his work and sanctified it, the world, and also formed man out of the dust of the earth. Now, what is he saying? The first six days of creation he organized the physical orb. What did he do on the seventh day? He finished it and he sanctified it. He brought it into full paradisical glory. And what else did he do? All right. In addition to that, then, he says he also then formed man out of the dust of the earth. Man is ordained under the sixth day, fulfilled under the seventh. Now, and he uses that as an illustration. Note how he words it. We are to understand that as God made the world, we're going to use this now to illustrate something else. As God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he finished his work and sanctified and also formed man out of the dust of the earth, even so, in the beginning of the seventh thousand years, will the Lord God sanctify the earth. There is a likeness between creation and cleansing. He will sanctify the earth and complete the salvation of man. Now, what does that mean to complete the salvation of man? That means give the righteous fullness, and bring them into the house of the Lord, endow them with glory and all of that, see? All right? And judge all things and shall redeem all things except that which he hath not put into his power when he shall have sealed all things to the end of all things ought to be capitalized. Why? Who is the end of all things? Who is the beginning and the end? It's Christ. And so you seal all things to the end of all things. And the sounding of the trumpets of the seven angels are the preparing and finishing of this work, of his work, in the beginning of the seventh thousand years. You see that? After the opening of the seventh seal, the beginning of it, the preparing, he says, of the way before the time of his coming. So Christ does not come at the opening of the seventh seal. You have the half hour of silence, and then you have the judgments, and all this designed to do what? To sanctify the earth, to complete the salvation of man. This is the harvest season. This is the parable of the wheat and the tares. 
to bring them into the church of the firstborn, give them full blessings of exaltation, and all this then in the 7,000 years. Now, we should have put that one in. Now, going from there then to Revelation 10, John has a special ministry on that, you see. John has a special ministry, and that special ministry is depicted in a little book that's given to him, and he's told to eat it. And it has some interesting uh, tastes in relation to it, which are referred to there. But it symbolizes the mission that he is given now, and for this then he was translated, one reason for it, to bring the house of Israel to the Lord. Okay? Now that's chapter 10. Now what's chapter 11 about? Well, chapter 11 then deals with these two prophets. Coming back to this afternoon's discussion, where we indicated the second coming of Christ is actually a series of events, that he comes first of all to Zion. And that appearance to Zion then, uh, actually there will be multiple appearances. The Book of Mormon twice, once in, in uh, 3 Nephi 20 and the other in 3 Nephi 21, talks about Christ coming to Zion. And he indicates that when the new Jerusalem is built and the power of God descends upon them, then he makes this statement, verse 25 of 3 Nephi 21, then shall the power of, God, of heaven come down among them, and I also will be in the midst. Now, he said that before in 3 Nephi 20, see. And so uh, it's in this period of time when Zion is cleansed, and after the opening of the seventh seal, that Christ then comes and dwells with his saints. Technically, this is the beginning of the millennium. And among the saints, among whom he then lives, they will have the blessings of Christ's appearance. You see that? They will have him coming to them in this period of time. And uh, so, in a way, then Christ does come somewhere around the opening of the seventh seal. Somehow, but he doesn't come to the world. He will come then to the faithful Latter-day Saints who have been cleansed and keep in time between now and then. The righteous remnant has got to be cleansed and uh, prepared, and the new Jerusalem has got to be established. And then Christ will come, just like Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 59. And you need to read verse 19 as well as 20. 19 refers to the warfare against Zion. And then chapter or verse 20 refers to Christ coming to, to Zion uh, in the last days. Let me read it. Verse 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. Now that's the great and abominable church gathering multitudes to make war against Zion. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. What does Nephi see happens when, when the enemy comes in against the saints? The power of God in great glory rests upon him. And then in the next verse he says, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. Remember also we read that statement from Moroni, Moroni's visit to Joseph Smith on the hill Cumorah, where he says then that the saints will be persecuted until they finally receive an inheritance where the glory of the Lord rests upon them. And when this takes place, he says, then the ten tribes were revealed in the north country. And then he says, and when this takes place, then will be fulfilled the words of Isaiah, the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and to those then who turn from ungodliness in Jacob. See? And so Christ will come to faithful Latter-day Saints very near to the time of the opening of the seventh seal. Now, how far is that in the future? I'll leave that for you and to work out. See, And in that sense, then, uh, he comes in that respect. To, uh, uh, to them, and uh, uh, then as the 144,000 do their work and bring people into the church of the firstborn, and they're sanctified, and they're given those higher priesthood blessings in the house of the Lord when this, this is done, 
and their, when their work is done, then Christ will come suddenly to his temple. Now, the word suddenly didn't mean suddenly after Malachi's day. It means suddenly after that work is done. And Christ will then come to his temple. And as we pointed out this afternoon, I think it was, I, I'm getting in the bla maze on what I've talked about, uh, we will find then that his coming to put the capstone on is to make them kings and priests in actual fact, see. Now, they've got to be brought into the church of the firstborn. They've got to be given fullness of priesthood and the promises and guarantees relating to that, see. They've got to be given those things. And then Christ comes to his temple and puts the capstone on. And that will take place after the ministry of the 144,000. And then after that, you'll have the great council of Adam on Diom. And why is it after his coming to his temple? This is easily understood when you understood the council of Adam on Diamond. There's a great judgment held. People who have keys of priesthood in past ages stand in judgment for what they've done. Uh, but not only is that the case then, not only is that the case, but having been judged for their, their stewardships in past ages, then they scratch their heads a little bit and say, you know, we had a glorious time. Moses will say, we had a glorious time at Mount Sinai, but I never did get those people to believe very much. And then, then they never really built the holy order in their midst. And we never built that up and put the capstone on. And so our dispensation is incomplete. There are many people who didn't even really get the gospel. And so our dispensation is really incomplete. And then Peter will come along to Joseph in that council and say, you know, we had a great time. I had marvelous powers given to me. I healed the sick and all of that kind of thing. And we had great things given to us. But you know, we never built the holy order and put the capstone on. We didn't do that. We didn't get our dispensation completed. And the same will be true of all the other prophets. Even Enoch will say that. Because as good as he was in his day, he did not get Zion built to the point that they put the capstone on before the great council of Adam on Diamond, on which Adam held three years previous to his death. There were many of them who had come up to that, but not all. And so they will have to wait to the second great, dispen great Adam on Diamond council. And when this is held, Joseph will say, well, you know, we have got the capstone put on ours. It's completed. And I'll tell you what I think we can do. If you, brethren, will be sealed to me, so that you come into and become part of the dispensation of the fullness of times, and this is when we really make the dispensation of the fullness of times. Some people think that because we've got a restoration of all keys from past dispensations that we got the dispensation of the fullness of times. That is not true. That's only foundation. The next thing that's necessary is to build Zion and put the capstone on, and then you've got to go to Adam on Diamond, and then you've got to seal the other dispensations into and under the canopy of this dispensation, and that makes the dispensation of the fullness of dispensations. And it's just like the prophet said here in 168 of the, of the teachings where he says, for example, now again God has purposed in himself that there should not be an eternal fullness until every dispensation should be fulfilled and gathered together in one, until you've got to gather all past dispensations into this dispensation. And when you do, it makes the dispensation of the fullness of dispensations, or another way of saying it is the dispensation of the fullness of times, the word dispensation and times being synonymous. Okay? Now, where is that done? That's done at Adam on Diamond. And can you fulfill all things and gather them to a fullness if the capstone hasn't been put on Zion if Zion hasn't indeed been made an order of kings and of priests and queens and priestesses and the capstone has been put on see now this has to be done then before the great council of Adam on Diamond and it has to take place after the ministry of the 144,000 and when the ministry of 144,000 is over then the great prophecy of the of Malachi will fulfill where the Lord will come suddenly to his temple. See. After that, then the great Daniel vision of Daniel 7, where he sees the Ancient of Days uh, come and the great Adam on Diamond Council. And there's the judgment that's set, and then you begin to look around and say, how and how are we going to prepare people for the second coming? 
prophet here in the teachings, page 157, deals with that, and he uh, expresses it this way. He says, uh, Daniel in the seventh chapter speaks of the Ancient of Days. He means the oldest man, our father Adam, Michael. He will call his children together and hold a council with them, and note this now, to prepare them for the coming of the Son of God. Now, how does he prepare them? Well, he prepares them, as the prophet Joseph says in relation to the book of Revelation, where you seal all things to the end of all things. You see that? You seal all things to the end of all things. You seal all things to Christ. And how do you seal all things to Christ? You start out and you seal all things to Joseph first, just like the scriptures indicate. Then this whole order of things. You have a program where the first is last and the last is first. Note, for example, where the Lord says here in section 29, verse 30, and remember that all in all my judgments that are given unto men, and as the words have gone forth out of my mouth, even so shall they be fulfilled, that the first shall be last and that the last shall be first in all things whatsoever I have created by the word of my power, which is the power of my spirit. And then turn over to you to Matthew 19, where the Savior is talking to his disciples, and the apostle Peter, little impetuous, uh, looks at his life of persecution and his following the Savior and wonders what he's going to get out of it. And I guess that's a legitimate wonder. And he expresses that, and he says, uh, uh, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall for we have therefore? What, what shall we have therefore? And then the Savior tells them, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then the judgment isn't that you're rewarded to be a bishop in the celestial kingdom or a stake president in the celestial kingdom or one of the brethren, like lots of people want to be in the celestial kingdom. See. Rather, instead, he says, and everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. In other words, you perfect the holy order, the family order, and a man then may have uh, a family relationship over his physical posterity, and he may be a father spiritually like Abraham over others. And those who have forsaken the Lord, the, the world, and followed the Lord will be given a hundredfold of fathers and mothers and so forth, because they have a presidency within the holy order. And then note what he says in the next verse. He says, But many that are first shall be last in this judgment of things, and the last shall be first. Now who's the last dispensation? Who presides over it? Who's going to put the capstone on finally? And when he gets the capstone on, and the holy order is built, completed, and you go to Adam on Diamond and he visits around with Peter, and Peter says, hey, we didn't do it. Then Joseph says, hey, I got a way. I know a way to do that. You be sealed to me and come into my dispensation, become part of it, and we've still got people working around on earth doing temple work, and we'll have your people's work done for them, see? And so Peter's dispensation is brought to a completion and the fullness in Joseph. And Moses says the same thing, and the Jaredites say the same thing, and the Nephites say the same thing, and Enoch comes up a little bit shy, great and glorious he is, and says, you know, we did pretty good, but we didn't quite cut it, Brother Joseph, and Joseph says, that's fine, you come on in too. You see that? And the last becomes first. And all dispensations are gathered into the dispensation of the fullness of times, to make the dispensation of the fullness of times. And this is done at Adam on Diamond, see? Now, when this takes place, then you're ready to go to, the, to Jerusalem. The Jewish people haven't yet as a nation been brought in. And so you're ready to go in the great prophetic timetable to Jerusalem. And so John sees then in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation these two prophets who are sent to Jerusalem during the period of the abomination of desolation in the last days. He sees that, and he sees their ministry, and he sees the power of the spirit that they have. And this is a day of power, see? And they have that spiritual power with them, and uh, meantime there has been gathered to 
to uh, Jerusalem many Jewish converts, and there is a Jewish church made up of Jewish converts, the covenant people of the Lord that Nephi saw, Nephi saw on whom the power of God in great glory rested as well as upon the Latter-day Saints. And they flee to Jerusalem, and by their faith, uh, I'm getting a little ahead of the story because all of them don't stay there, but those who stay support by their faith these two prophets. It takes power of faith to perform the works of righteousness that they perform. And they hold in abeyance these uh, uh, great forces that gather against Jerusalem, the heathen forces, uh, the Assyrian and Babylon, the two combine together as they go against Jerusalem. And as they do then, finally, though, these, these forces overrun the city. And these two prophets then are killed and lie in the street. And as they are killed and lie in the street for a period of time, the Revelation says this, uh, uh, and that their dead bodies lie in the street for three days and a half, and shall not be suffered their, their dead bodies to be put into graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. You'll get the media going there, and everyone will be happy that those two guys have finally been taken care of, see. And uh, so they, they send gifts back and forth to each other, and they get all ready now. They celebrate before they're going to go in now to mop up the Jewish people. All right, but just about that point, Christ stands on the Mount of Olives, which is after three days and a half, the spirit of life came, of, of spirit of life from God entered into them. When Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives, that signals the resurrection of the righteous. And uh, with that great cataclysmic upheaval taking place, the graves of the righteous will be open. What happens to those two prophets who are laying in the streets? Well, they get resurrected too. And it says, for example, uh, they heard a voice came in, coming, saying, Coming up hither, and as they ascended into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to God, and so forth. See, now these events then center in Jerusalem. Now how about Revelation chapter 12? Another special spotlight which is vital to us to understand. Let me, though, in order to get to it, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, in the Prophet Joseph Smith's inspired revision of the Bible. You can't get this from the King James Version. You have to get it from the Prophet's inspired revision. And uh, let, me, let me make a clarification to begin with, and then we'll get to it. Whenever the Lord ordains an earth to be created and inhabited or populated, along with that ordination is the ordination that there will be two great centers of power. One will be called Jerusalem, and the other will be called Mount Zion. And the Jerusalem and the Mount Zion that we have on this earth, to be built on this earth, then, are patterns of an eternal plan. The prophet Joseph Smith, for example, makes this comment in the teachings, page 12. He says, A man may be saved after the judgment in the terrestrial kingdom or in the telestial kingdom, but he can never see the celestial kingdom of God without being born of water into the Spirit. Now note he's added comment. He may receive a glory like unto the moon or like the stars, he says, but he can never come to Mount Zion. He's talking about getting your head above the veil and, and back there. Mount Zion is up there, really. The Mount Zion on here is merely the funneling down of knowledge and truth and the building of an order of things that approximates that one up there. Now, he's talking about the blessings of the second comforter. He can never come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. There's two, see, Mount Zion and the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, for example, let me give you a reference here from 3 Nephi 20. And this is another reason why, when you study the Book of Mormon, read every word, and then read those words backwards, if it has to, and upside down and over and crossways, because every word becomes important at points. Now, in 3 Nephi 20, he's talking about the great judgments that are associated with and finally consummate in the building of the new Jerusalem on this earth and the sanctification of Jerusalem in Palestine, 
and the establishment then of the great world order of millennial righteousness where the law goes forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he says this now in verse 36. And then shall be brought to pass that which is written. And he quotes Isaiah here, but he adds something to him. Then shall that which is brought to pass come to, pa come to pass which is written. Awake, awake again. The word again is not in Isaiah. Jesus put it in. Awake, awake again, and put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For thenceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion. Now you ask yourself this question. Whenever before in this mortal period of time, from the days of Adam down, have we had Zion and Jerusalem rise to become universal powers in the earth? When did that happen the first time? In the latter day when it happens, it's going to be the second time it happened. Awake, awake again. Do it over again. Do it over again, the second time. You see that? Awake, awake again, and put on strength. When did it happen the first time that Zion arose in power and Jerusalem to become a universal order, a millennial system? When did it happen? Well, it didn't. And it's not talking about the first time being in mortality. And that's the thing I want you to see now. And that's what Revelation chapter 12 was all about. The war in heaven is a prototype of the warfare against Zion on earth. Now, we've said before earlier that the general pattern of warfare against Zion has two main divisions or two main thrusts or attacks. One, then, is the warfare against Zion in America and the elements of Zion throughout the world by the multitudes from of the abominable church that gather against them. Now, they don't overrun us. They cleanse us. They do us good. and. Uh, kick us into the dust and bat us over the head with a four before, and they do a lot of other things, but they merely cleanse the righteous and sanctify them. And out of that whole difficulty, you establish the new Jerusalem thing. And uh, then after we've established the new Jerusalem in that purpose, then he knows, he knows there can't be an eternal fullness unless the two cities are established in righteousness and power. And he knows that if he can thwart the work of the Lord in at Jerusalem, he can in some measure gain a tactical advantage and prevent the Lord from reigning in full glory and power. And so he then shifts his gears, and all nations are gathered against Jerusalem. There's, there's three great gatherings spoken of, for example. Here in the teachings, page 231, the prophet puts it this way. The three gate gatherings, the saints of God will be gathered in one from every nation. The Jews will be gathered together in one. And the wicked will also be gathered together to be destroyed, as spoken of by the prophet of it. Well, John the Revelator does, Joel does, Isaiah does. They speak of the gathering to Jerusalem to be destroyed. You see that? And so when Lucifer can't achieve his purposes in relation to Zion, he gathers all nations against Jerusalem in, in, in a, a great zealous attack against the Jewish people. And he would succeed, too, except Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives. Now that great scenario had a pre-earth, a pre-earth original design, the war in heaven in the first estate was a warfare against Zion. And that's what Revelation chapter 12 was all about. It's a war. And the warfare there followed the same pattern. It was made against Zion, the holy city, which held under the bombardment. And then he shifted to Jerusalem. Now, with that introduction, let me read chapter 12. John puts it this way. And there appeared a great sign in heaven. Now, this is the inspired revision, and it doesn't say all of this in the King James. And there appeared a great sign in heaven, 
in the likeness of things on the earth. So what he sees in pre-earth life is a likeness of what he has seen in the book of Revelation in the warfare against Zion there on earth, see. Okay? A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And the woman, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, that's political power. And her child, now we're talking about pre-earth life, we're not doing anything here on this earth yet, her child was caught up into God and his throne. Now, that's a scene that took place in the spirit world in the first estate. Now, what do those symbols mean? Let me read on. And there appeared another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. Satan is symbolized under that sign having seven heads and ten horns. Now, those seven heads and ten horns represent Babylon. You read the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 13 and others, and they, these are the symbols that represent Babylon. And what he's saying here is that there was Babylon in, in the first estate. It wasn't just a quarrel over free agency. You don't become perdition by that, and you don't follow Lucifer with his appeal because you're just a righteous person who doesn't really think that uh, you want to risk it and ready to get a little agency, you follow Satan because you have become corrupted and you've become Babylon. And you know darn well that intrinsically the character of your being is such, if you go to mortality under the power of the fall, that you're not going to make it. And so you are ready to bargain away your free agency and, uh, and take and buy the plan of some guy who says, hey, you give me your agency and I'll get you all back. You see that? All right, so there was a Babylon in pre-earth life, and there appeared another sign. Now, this is in heaven, and it's also in likeness of things on the earth. There appeared another sign, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, and his tail do a third part of the stars of heaven. Don't hassle on that point. It was a part, not a fraction. And he says, did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman. Now, this is still talking about scenes in pre-earth life. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was delivered, ready to devour her child after it was born. Now, that's a kind of a gruesome thing. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her for a thousand two hundred and threescore years. Now, the King James Version says days, a thousand three hundred and threescore days. Joseph changed it to years. I'll just note that and we'll come back to it. And there was war in heaven. Now, this is the war in heaven. This is the pre-earth scene. Now, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought against Michael. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God. Now we've got the meaning of one of those symbols. The woman is, is a representative of what? The church of God. Where? In the first estate. And she brought forth a man-child. And that man-child then was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. I'll just read on. The dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. Now, the day will come when the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will have to give birth to the government of God. It won't be given birth to by the Gentiles or by the heathens. It'll be faithful Latter-day Saints who have built a foundation of free and open union and who sustain the Constitution and who give birth to the government of God. And this will be after the pattern of pre-earth life. Now, what John is saying is this. He sees a, a sign in heaven in the likeness of things on earth. And what he sees there now is the war in heaven. And in the war in heaven, then, he sees a woman. And this woman now is the church.
It's the pre-earth church in the first estate. And she had on her head a crown of twelve stars. And the woman who was with child, and she cried to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. She brought forth the government of God in the first estate. But Lucifer was there, ready to devour it. And so the woman then fled into the wilderness. Now, the term fleeing into the wilderness has more than one expression. DNC section 5 talks about the church uh, coming forth out of the wilderness in modern times, 1830. And so people try and apply that to that. But note, Joseph Smith said that she fled into the wilderness for a period of 1,000. Uh, 1,260 years. Okay? If the restoration of the gospel, if that's talking about that there, what is 1,260 years minus 1830? Which would be when the church went into the wilderness, right? If you, take, if you call that the apostasy. Well, it would come out the year 570 A.D., which would mean that there was no apostasy from Christendom until 570 A.D. or better than 250 years after the Nicene Council. Now, does that apply then? Is that what it's talking about? Is that talking about the, the Christian apostasy? And the answer is no. It's talking about the warfare in heaven. And in the warfare in heaven, then, Lucifer unleashed his power against Zion, and she stood. And the church gave birth. To a child, but as that was born, it was caught up into heaven. And he turned his power then against this woman. And she drove, was driven into the wilderness for a period of 1,260 years. And uh, in other words, the woman, the church at Jerusalem fled. She fled to Zion. There strengthened her powers. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. And they finally mustered enough power in Zion to go back to Jerusalem. And when they did, note what happens. He says, neither, uh, he says, the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Neither was there place found in heaven for the great dragon who was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and also called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice then in heaven saying, Now is come salvation, and the strength, and the power. Now is come salvation, and the strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, for they have been, for they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the powers of Christ and his infinite atonement. They have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, and they loved not their own lives, but kept the testimony unto death, and so forth. And so when the woman then was driven into the wilderness for a thousand two hundred and sixty years, and the war in heaven took place, they mustered the power necessary, and they threw the rascal out. And that's how Satan got cast out of heaven. They established God's kingdom, this man child that was born to rule all nations in the spirit world with the rod of iron, and under that righteous rule with Zion established and purified, then they threw the devil out. And then he heard a voice saying, Now is come salvation and the strength and the power of our God and the kingdom of Christ. Now that was the episode of the war in heaven. John sees it as a sign in heaven in the likeness of things that are to take place on earth. Now, on earth you're going to do the same scene. And in the latter days then, as this scenario begins, when the Lord then selects those to come to earth, when he really wants to establish his Zion, he then takes those who stood the test of fire against them in the warfare in heaven, in the warfare against Zion. And he appoints many of them to come to earth in the last days who have backbone enough to stand up and be men and women and who have integrity enough to receive the gospel and apply it and to meet the onslaught of persecution and of insinuating accusations and to finally move on under the warfare against Zion and establish Zion. And then when that happens, 
Then, in the latter days, the scene will shift now to Jerusalem. And that's what the rest of the chapter 12 was all about. And he sees then the, sh the, the scene shift to Jerusalem. And as it shifts to Jerusalem, there's a church there in Jerusalem. And let me read now what he says. And he says, And after these things I heard another voice saying, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, yea, and they who dwell upon the isles of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he, is, he hath but a short time. For when the dragon saw that he was cast out into the earth after this warfare in heaven, and they threw the rascal out. Then he persecuted the woman which was, had brought forth the man-child. So he comes around and persecutes the church here on earth, who is going to bring forth the government of God and establish the millennial kingdom. See, He says, Therefore to the woman were given two wings. And here he's talking about the church in Jerusalem, if you'll let, permit a, a clarification. He says, Therefore to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, and she, that she might flee into the wilderness, into her place, where she was nourished for a time and times and dividing of times. Now what does that mean? A time, times, and dividing of times. Well, it's just another way of saying 1,260 days. And these 1,260 days are patterned after the 1,260 years of the warfare against Zion when the concentration was against Jerusalem before they finally massed power and threw him out. Now, know what John says. He says, Therefore the woman was given two wings, the great eagle, she might flee into the wilderness for a time, times, and half time, and so forth. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as the flood after the woman. He is the great prince of the power of the air, and he controls the elements. And as the remnants of the Jewish church, many of them fled when the abomination of desolation got underway. Then the adversary then endeavors to destroy them through the natural forces that he has control over. And uh, he sent forth a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Therefore the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war against the remnant of her seed, which rest there in, in Jerusalem, which kept the commandments of the Lord and have the testimony of Jesus. And then the finishing of the story is that as those people flee then to Mount Zion, Others then stay, and that's an interesting choice you have to make. Here's the abomination of desolation getting underway. You understand the prophetic picture. You know that this is going to be the cleansing and the redemption of Jerusalem, and you're one of the Jewish saints who's gathered to Jerusalem. And you see the armies come, and you know also that it's necessary to gear up your soul and generate spiritual power in order to get victory. And it isn't just enough to stay there and hang in that you've got to do something for your native land on the basis of faith and the sealing powers and the powers of Zion. And so there are those then who flee from Zion, I mean from Jerusalem, and go to Mount Zion. And they will go there for 1,260 days, which is patterned after the original. And there will be others then who remain there, and by their faith they'll sustain the two prophets. And their alternative is this. If we get killed, the resurrection comes on us right quick. Meantime, we love our Jerusalem. We love Jerusalem. These are the events when the Jewish nation are going to be converted in a day. We want to be here. We want by our faith to sustain this. And so they do that, and they stay there, and Lucifer makes war against them. Now, meantime, what's going on in Zion? We're endeavoring to gear ourselves with power now to do that final thing. Take that rascal and throw him out the second time. We want to do that. And so we're gearing spiritual power. And those Jewish saints come. And we do that. And then in the great events of Zion, the council of, uh, of Adam on Dial and so forth, the judgment is set and things are ready for the second coming. And then the Savior takes a group of people from Mount Zion. He says, come on, boys. It's time now to go to Jerusalem. We have now got the faith to develop among these people necessary to do the job. And so he takes a group of people, of the saints. Hebrew C. Kimball said he was going to be there anyway. 
and others, and he takes them, and they go and stand on the Mount of Olives just at the nick of time. And they overthrow the forces of darkness, and uh, they sanctify the Jews. They cleanse Jerusalem. They rebuild the temple, and they sanctify it, and they administer the ordinances of the temple. And they give fullness of priesthood to the, to the Jewish people. And they prepare them by bringing them into the church of the firstborn. And all of this now is preparatory work. They've stopped the forces and the powers there by Christ coming to the Mount of Olives. And they then do this. And when they have done that and the Jewish people now are brought into the church of the firstborn, then Christ comes in his glory. Then those who are righteous on earth are caught up to meet him the resurrection of the righteous having previously take place, just as Paul says, that, that uh, we which are alive shall not prevent those which are dead, for the dead in Christ shall rise first. See, Now, in that sense, then, you have that great scenario. And what John sees is the war in heaven in pre-earth life as a type and shadow of the warfare against Zion of which the book of Revelation is all about, which it's dealing with. You see that? And that great cleansing program that comes against Zion and finally consummates in Jerusalem and ends up with establishing the millennial reign and throwing the rascal out and having an era of peace and righteousness, just like they did in the war in heaven. Now that is what it's all about. And that's why Isaiah says, as quoted by the Savior, awake, awake again. Let's do it again now, boys. Awake, awake again. Put on righteousness, see. And in this sense, bring these two great poles of power back then on this earth into being to usher in a millennial era on this earth of righteousness and peace, just like the glory and power of God was made manifest in the spirit world when they finally threw the devil out. Now, all right, now I've got to hurry. I've got about two minutes, and I want to get through to chapter 14. We talked about chapter 13 the other day. It merely talks about the two powers, Babylon and the little horn. Now, as I worked this thing through and studied it out and pondered and prayed on it, I had a great big question. Why did the Lord wait till the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation to talk about the restoration of the gospel? Why did he? Why did he do that? After all, in sequence of things, He's talked about, for example, this, this Revelation chapter 7, 144,000, and that's way after the restoration of the gospel. He's talked about Revelation chapter 8 and 9, the great judgments, that's still further after it. He's talked about the Jerusalem scene. He's talked about the, uh, the warfare in heaven being a likeness of the warfare on earth. He's talked about that. He's also talked about the, the two powers that are together, and then we say that he saw another angel flying through the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. Now, why wait till then? Well, again, the Book of Mormon gives you the key. Now, in Nephi's great vision, he sees this warfare against Zion. He sees the cleansing of Zion. He uses the Isaiah prophecies to tell us plainly about us. God is going to cleanse this people, and God is going to cleanse this land. And he tells us that very, very plainly. And then he tells us about this great work that is going to go forth to such an, to such an extent <coughs> that people will either be polarized on one side of the issue or on the other. And there will be a great division that takes place. And Nephi then sees that and talks about it in 2 Nephi chapter 30, which among everything else we've talked about so far, we haven't yet got to. And he says this, For the time speedily cometh, verse 10, that the Lord shall cause a great division among the people, and the wicked will be he destroy, and he will spare his people, Yea, even if so, but he has, must destroy the wicked by fire. Now, he's just giving you a generalized statement, comment, out of having seen the same thing that John the Revelator saw. Now, on that basis, then what's Revelation chapter 14 about? Well, it's about the great division. And he's taught and shown that that great division is produced by the restoration of the gospel. 
But he begins, as Revelation 14 opens up, and I'll get to the King James Version on that just as well. Uh, he begins then with his description of the righteous in that great division. And uh, he has this to say about it here in chapter 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Now this is Zion established now finally upon her mount in glory and power. And with him an hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the harps, the voice of harpers uh, harping with their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000. They have a unique and distinct position with the Lord. They are they in the holy order who are sealed immediately and directly to him, just like the Lord promised the twelve in Luke chapter 20. Ye are they then who will eat at my same table. They are sealed in the holy order directly, and they have a role then that's unique and distinct. And so he sees then Christ stand upon Mount Zion, and he sees then the 144,000, and he's taught that they're a distinct body. And he says, These are they which are not defiled by women, for they are virgins. And some people think they're all a bunch of bachelors. And they've never heard the story of the ten virgins, and that includes men and women. The word virgin here merely means sanctified one. And they're they who have fullness of priesthood. And you don't give fullness of priesthood except to a man and a woman combined together jointly, do you? And so they're all good married guys. Believe me that, brethren and sisters. They're all good married folk. But they're called virgins because of their purity. And he says, And they are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. He has, they have that relationship. These are redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and the Lamb. They stand at the firstfruits, eat at the same table, are sealed in the holy order immediately to Christ. And in their mouth, was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, in order to bring this about, this great division, where he sees Mount Zion and the 144,000 on it, then he sees that the means of bringing this about would be the restoration of the gospel in the last days. And so he says now in verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And then there followed another angel after this. Now the great division is underway and taken place, and it's been brought about by the restoration of the gospel and the proclaiming of this gospel by the angel to all the earth. And then there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture upon the, uh, into the cup of the, in his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment is sent up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. And uh, he goes on to talk about it. And then, having seen this great division and, and the predicted fall of judgment of Babylon, then he sees the harvest season. Now note what he says. Verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, thus saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. Here's Christ, having on his head a crown of gold, a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat upon the cloud, Thrust thy sickle and reap. See, this is the harvest. For the time is coming to reap, for thee to reap, for the harvest is ripe, of the earth is ripe. And he that sat upon the crown thrust his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now this is the gathering of the wheat. This is the gathering. You see the great division. 
You see, that division is produced by the restoration of the gospel, by the angel flying through the midst of heaven. Then you see the proclamation that Zion, that, that Babylon is, is fallen. And then in this whole scenario, you see, first of all, that Christ then thrusts in his sickle and he reaps the righteous and gathers them in. And then in verse 17, another angel came out from the temple which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle, and John is seeing now beyond the veil. And another angel come out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now this gathering here is the gathering of the wicked to Jerusalem to be destroyed. And he says, And the angel thrust in his sickle in the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And that's Jerusalem. And he says, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came from the winepress, even unto a horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. There will be that much blood shed in the valley of Jehoshaphat, which is just between Jerusalem, the Mount Moriah, and the Mount of Olives. It will run bridle deep because of the slaughter that takes place there. All right, now this then is the great division, the great division produced by the restoration of the gospel, the great division seen by John when he sees the 144,000 stand on Mount Zion, and he sees that they're a select group, and he sees that they sing a new song, and he sees that they're sealed directly and directly related to, to the Christ. And then, then he shifts and sees now how this is all brought about. The angel flying through the midst of heaven. And then after that, Babylon is said to fall. And then he finally sees specifically the gathering of the righteous and the gathering of the wicked. And in the gathering of the wicked, they're gathered to Jerusalem to be destroyed. And in that destruction, the destruction is so devastating and so gruesome that blood runs to the, to the bridle of the horse's bit. See, that's how it is, see. All right, now in that sense then, then he sees chapter 15 and 16, which is a review then of the, of the plagues. Chapter 17 is a depicting of the woman Babylon under the symbol of a great woman, scarlet, with uh, the words mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and abominations of the earth written on her. Chapter 18 then and 19 gets you into the second coming of Christ. Chapter 20 is the... John, the Revelator's great vision of the millennial period, where Satan then is taken and bound for a thousand years. And after the thousand years is over, then he's loosed, and the great judgment takes place, the resurrection of, the, of all men, both, both uh, small and great, and they stand before God in the final great judgment. And when that is taken, uh, the portrayed, then he sees chapter 21, the new heaven and the new earth. And this is the new celestial heaven and the new earth. And he talks about it, see. And so the book of Revelation deals with what? Well, it deals with fulfilling this great objective of making this earth a celestial orb. It deals with the great gathering of the righteous in the latter days. The harvest season. The harvest season where, where you gather the righteous into the church of the firstborn and where the wicked are gathered together finally to Jerusalem to be destroyed, see. It sees that marvelous thing. It's the plainest book, one of the plainest books God ever caused to be written. It's as easy to understand as the alley -oop comic strip, if you'll read it in the right context, see. Now, may the Lord bless you, my brothers and sisters. It's been a thrill to be with you. I feel that he's given us strength. When I got here the other day, I felt like I was just about half sick and ready with a real throat problem. And I ask the Lord to help me on this one. And I believe he has. I believe he has. I just want you to know that I know that the gospel is true. I know that Jesus is the Christ with an absolute knowledge. I know that this is his work. I know that the greatest responsibility of a Latter-day Saint is to yield obedience to the living prophet and join with him hand in hand in the program that he's inaugurated, and that goes to with his stake president and his bishop. You can't build Zion on your own. You can only build Zion under the mantle of authority that's given your bishop and your stake president. And so please, brothers and sisters, unite 
get away from the cliques, get away from the special hobby situations, get the vision of Zion, get on fire to get your home teaching done with the Spirit of the Lord in your life, get your welfare programs, be generous in your consecration, live the temple covenants, join together with a oneness that comes from the Spirit of the Lord and a love that's born of the love of Christ and the power of His Spirit in your life, and let's build Zion. I bear you my testimony that God does live and this is His work and that Ezra Taft Benson is His prophet and that your respective stake presents are called of God and have the mantle of God. I've never seen one that didn't when I've talked with them. And let's take that and act on it. And then let's get this great vision of things. You know, the Book of Mormon is a miracle. When you think of all of this stuff put in there in clarification in one working day period, working period of 75 days or less, producing a document that does all this, and I haven't even got started yet. I haven't. I've run out of time. I haven't got started yet, hardly, see. And all of this then comes in the Book of Mormon, and there's a lot more. And how Joseph Smith got that all packed in there and put in proper perspective and so fine a way with so precise a language that opens up the vision of things. How did he do that? Expect by infinite intelligence and knowledge. How could he do that, see? He was a prophet of God. If there's ever been a prophet of God, it was him. He was a greater prophet than Moses a greater seer than Samuel. He had a more uh, dramatic rise out of humble, more humble circumstances than Abraham Lincoln. And he, and not Emerson, is our wisest American. And he's our prophet. And I love him. I love to hear his voice, the spirit bearing weapon of him. I have studied him all my life. I know that he was a prophet of God, and I know this work is true. I pray that testimony in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Do you want to have closing prayer, and then we'll answer the questions of any of the want to stay? Could you your I penned in these words, which are really inadequate, but it was the best I could do at the moment, to Brother and Sister Hiram Andrews in deep appreciation for the great Book of Mormon seminar that you blessed us with in the Snowflake State. Thanks for sharing uh, <laughs> with us your deep well of knowledge and wisdom, signed President Flake of the Snowflake State. Thank you. We'd like to make this presentation to you. Thank you, President. Wants to know we love you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. We just deeply appreciate this. Thank you. you won't get a lot of scripture out of it, but you'll <laughs> see a lot of good, faithful people. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, this has been a tremendous and a great seminar. Our vision has been enlarged. We have seen a great table of delicious food placed before us that we have the right to work for and strive to get. Uh, now we go back into the cold, cruel world and do what we have to do in order to get it. He's tantalized us with these great blessings. It's been a great seminar, but you know, I haven't learned any new doctrine. Most of you here can probably say the same. I've had the doctrines that I've known enlarged upon and embellished upon and much more information given, but it's the same doctrine we hear year after year and day after day from our great apostles and prophets, and those people with the mantle of authority. I know now that it's the job to get back down in the trenches and to do those things that he's told us told us to do, those fulfill those jobs that we have in the church, to do our home teaching, to do our visiting teaching, to more importantly than anything else, take care of our families, to go home and teach our children the principles of the gospel, and to live celestially in our families, and improve our lives to gain a special relationship with the Savior and with our Heavenly Father, that we might be able to reap the blessings that we've been talked about and to talk to about. And, and then to play a part 
in this great work that's to be done. This is there for us if we'll do what we can to play a part. Now much has been said about the greatness of this seminar, and it is great, but we also have this opportunity at twice again each year as we listen to General Conference and hear our Apostles and Prophets. And where this seminar is so great is I think each one of us who have listened and learned can better understand what the brethren are telling us. You know, almost every major scripture that we went to through these 27 hours, I've had that underlined, and I've got them through listening to the brethren. I haven't put it together this well, but through this seminar, now we can more fully understand what the brethren are trying to tell us, more fully understand this great plan that is ours. I thank from the bottom of my heart, Brother and Sister Andrews, for sharing their wisdom and their understanding with us so that we can more fully understand the scriptures and understand the brethren as they talk to us. And I bear to you my testimony that the gospel is true. I know it with every fiber of my being. I thank each of you for the great people you are. I, great, I thank you neighboring stakes for coming and sharing this experience with us. I'd like to, to uh, give a great vote of thanks, and I hope you'll join with us for this great committee, Sanford and Louise and the great committee that, that did this. Those who can give a great vote of thanks for Brother and Sister Andrews and the committee, show it with the uplifted hand. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I bear to you my testimony of the truthfulness of the gospel, and I do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.